Hello. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me today. Um, yeah, so similarly, I, I like to um, dedicate this reading to, to, to what's going out there, um, to all those people who are expressing their, their acts of resistance and who are struggling to exist and finally um, putting voice to, to some of and assert their humanity out there. So the world right now is in, in fragments right now, but, but like someone told me once is that there's incredible energy in the fragment. So um, we can't forget that. And so I'm wishing, I'm wishing a lot of good health and safety to the people who are out there um, making sure that um, um, there's justice in the world. So um, having said that, yeah, it's, it's a real honor to be here um, to read um, for my book. Yeah, Spirit Run, 6,000 mile marathon through North America's stolen land. Um, it's great to talk to people back in the Northwest, um, uh, where I'm from, uh, Yakima, Washington. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. So again, my name is Noel Alvarez. Um, <clears throat> this story here is a, uh, a working class narrative about indigenous First Nations and Mexican peoples uh, who run from Alaska to Panama in pursuit of peace and dignity. Uh, it is a story about the capacity of ordinary people um, surviving. You know, it is about running as an act of resistance and it is a call to action. You know, it is it's about finding freedom and expelling the pain with our feet, you know, and, um, and talking about what running is. So, so yeah, a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in Raymond Carver country in uh, Yakima, Washington. Uh, on farmlands enriched by volcanic soils and by the hands of farm laborers like my Mexican immigrant parents. I grew up picking apples in the orchards with my father and in fruit packing warehouses with my mother. And I talk about these experiences in my book. When I got accepted into college, um, the pressure to save my family overwhelmed me and, and I quit. You know, I was 19 years old and you know, after working so hard to get to college, I, I let it go. Um, I was just overwhelmed with all that pressure and what it meant to be the first one to go um, you know, to college. And so it was then in 2004, when I was 19 years old, that I discovered a run called Peace and Dignity Journeys. It's a six month long run that indigenous people organize every four years. And you know, it changed my life. You know, the goal of Peace and Dignity Journeys was to visit with indigenous communities build relationships and engage in ceremony with them. The goal was to get us to move again, to take action for our, work, uh, our lives and to build momentum around running and carrying your community forward. On Peace and Dignity Journey, we ran with feathered staffs that symbolized the thousands of prayers and stories of indigenous communities we connected with. Feathers that represented specific things people wanted us to carry on the run for them, the death of a loved one, incarcerated youth, drug addiction, drought, decimated landscapes, contaminated waters, many heavy things. There's a main staff in Alaska that started with only three feathers symbolizing the indigenous nations of North America, Central America and South America. As the run progresses, weaving through communities, it accumulates feathers. It accumulates stories, prayers, pain, gaining weight over time as it traces through hundreds of communities. We run with these staffs bearing their weight, learning to work with the staffs and what they represent, to learn how to work with oneself and with our communities, learning how to properly honor the stories weaved into the staff, honoring our elders, embracing the future, learning to weave others and ourselves into the complicated narratives of our landscapes. Peace and Dignity Journeys is about carrying these bundles of stories embodied in the feathered staffs. It is about feeling the weight of your community, which puts things into perspective. You feel the weight of the responsibility you have to your people and community. The staffs, the weight of the feathers are a constant reminder of others and your responsibility to others. As a reminder that every step you take is not just yours, but that of others that the strength you put forth is not just your strength, but given to you through the power of story. This was the healing power of running on peace and dignity journey. It was helping us get back into the practice of being human again. 
what kept me going on peace and dignity journeys was this idea that I could destroy this belief that running was a bad thing. Running from gangs, border agents, our past, danger in general. That I could, with the bottoms of my feet, correct this path that my family led as immigrants. To be the first in my family tree to run because he wanted to, not because he had to. And not because he was running from danger, but because he was running as a way of life. Spirit Run explores the lives of people living on the margins, people who are trapped in the rhythms of suffering, like in the factories where my mother still works, places where bodies are instrumentalized and work worn out. People who are saying enough. This is why we run, this is why I run, to revive and restore our kindness with others. Spirit Run is a listening journey, and it is an expression of the human spirit. I want people who read Spirit Run to feel the language inside their bodies, to have visceral experiences of not only what it's like to run through the harsh landscapes, but also to feel the repetition of toil suffered by immigrants and the working class, like my mother who has begun to lose sensation in her hands from years of work. I want readers to inhabit this pain the confusion and the nausea of it all. I'm very proud of this book, but it is only a fragment of what it means to be Latino, what it means to be indigenous, what it means to be working class, what it means to be a runner. It is a painful read. You know, there are chapters in this book that I still can't read out loud. This book is about how running really becomes a healing act when you dedicate it to something greater than yourself when you run in the name of someone or something, when it becomes an act of remembrance, recalling the traumas, histories, the hurt, so as not to forget your story and those of your people, when it begins to dislodge you from the painful things that are weighing you down in life. I think running is a healing when it becomes a medium for prayer. So just a little bit about about that, and so I, I'd like to transition into a couple of reading, um, reading some chapters for y'all, um, and then if y'all have any questions, but but I hope that um, what I, I'm about to read sort of resonates with a lot of people. And to me, this book <clears throat> is my medicine, you know. And, and, and the reason I wrote it was um, that maybe it would resonate with many people out there and, and offer medicine to many people out there especially in these really hard times but I just wanted people to know that um, there are runners out there there are many of us out there and and we show up in full force right so you can see it out there in the streets right now that you aren't alone there, there are a lot of us out there trying to uh, amplify the voice of people who have been uh, displaced um, and dispossessed for far too long so I'd like to start off by reading um, the prologue of Spirit Run <clears throat> 2003, among the pines of Bellacoola in Canada's British Columbia, Canada, authorities escort a 17-year-old mother in handcuffs to identify and unearth the site where she buried a baby son a few days earlier. The teenage mother's name, Crow of the Sequekman Nation, whose full name translates to water waves, is reflected in her tears. The baby she buried was her firstborn son, pronounced dead at seven weeks old. For 49 days, her baby lived with the power of a name under the protection of sequent tradition of caring for one's own, blanketed with the dreams of a mother who sang to him until the very end when he stopped eating. Fearing that the hospital would take him away, Crow wrapped him into his curator board and escaped with him into the forest. She remembers that night in the mountains as very cold, the rain pelleted her as she and two others encircled the boy in a wall of ceremony before digging up a spot in the muddy earth with a shovel. The Sequekma people bury their own. But on this February day, the authorities unearthed the body of an infant, Nupika Amak, one who can travel between two worlds. Reversing the sacred order by which a Sequekma mother makes peace with the loss of a son. They desecrate the earth in front of her 
land that had laid claim to Nubika Amak's, Nubika Amak's spirit and bring him back to this world to be processed, tagged, and issued both a birth and death certificate. Then they take his mother back into custody for questioning. When asked why she didn't register her baby, because she wanted him to be a freedom baby, free from government oppression. In 2004, in a salmon fish hatchery in Shikaloon Village, Alaska, where snow is still thickly packed onto the ground and the air cuts a person's face like obsidian glass, 30-year-old Chula Pepper, a traveler from San Diego, California, stares into a mirror of a bathroom with a Swiss Army knife in hand. No job, no relationship, no home. She grabs her long hair and cuts like sickle tweet, long black strands before settling onto the cold floor, nearly bald. She shivers over the few things to her name, a backpack, some clothing, a sleeping bag, rain pants, and a tropic pass. Tomorrow, she decides life will be different. In the small town of Smithers, Canada, 19-year-old Zanya Longwolf of the Gitsan and Dakel Nation quits her job flipping burgers at a McDonald's and relinquishes her role as, a, as caretaker of a household in torment, an incarcerated father, a drug-addicted mother, and a murdered cousin along Canada's Highway of Tears. Against her mother's wishes, she withdraws what little savings she has from an ATM, purchases a backpack, and breaks from all she has ever known to join a caravan of indigenous runners. Still farther north, in one of the coldest parts of the Shraku, or Arctic village, Alaska, an elder named Ipana packs her life of 60 years into five oversized suitcases and travels to join the others. Indigenous runners from across the world congregating in Alaska for a race through North America toward Panama. In Fairbanks, Ipana, a leader in the Dene territories, a community aligned with the migratory patterns of the porcupine caribou, faces of wind and thinks about those ancient runners who had passed through these lands, migratory protectors of the sun who had moved with herds of caribou. The time has come for Ipana to find within herself the spirit of those runners, the sun people, to find the courage to leave home and spread the urgent message, the Arctic is dying. Around the same time in Oakland, California, 29-year-old Cheeto awakes to the day on which his dream will come true a dream of a run that unifies all people of the world and that takes him far away from an area he no longer feels a part of, the Bay Area, to which he was brought over from Mexico when he was only two years old. He has quit his job at EB Games, said goodbye to his nieces and nephews and scavenged the Bay Area's thrift stores for warm clothing. He packs his backpack, takes farewell photos with family, and washes down a couple of Heinekens at a going away party this afternoon. The next morning, he boards a gray van, which will take him to Alaska. Alone in the Hazlitt Basin in the foothills of the Sierra Mountains in Fresno, California, a man dials into his Apache and Purepecha heritage, beating a drum for guidance. Here, beside a fire pit among ponderosa pines in ceremonial sweat, Andrek prepares himself spiritually and mentally to co lead runners to the North America. He meditates for the courage and the clarity to lead indigenous warriors safely across vast lands. He sings and stokes the fire, calling on the wisdom of his Apache mother and Vietnam veteran elders who taught him about committing to things that are bigger and greater than oneself. He channels the wisdom of the medicine bag around his neck, Apache protection, he calls it, and drives a gray van all the way down to LA to pick up runners before driving far north to Alaska and search that person that his father wasn't. In Arizona, there's a man whose soul is branded by the tragedy of the copper mine strike of 1983. He, Pacquiao, the main leader of the run, was about 10 years old when he witnessed his hometown of Ajo, Arizona on lockdown, martial law enforced, the town besieged by bulldozers, snipers, police, and the National Guard. It was a, an event that displaced many residents separated families and converted the place into a near ghost town. For four days and four nights, Pacquiao of Yaki, Tohono Otam, and Opata heritage submerges himself in ceremony in an arid region of Southern Arizona. He sweats, fasts, and prepares himself to carry forward the immense weight laid upon him two years prior by the elder Gustavo. His mentor, a prominent labor movement leader and the founder of the sacred ultra marathons across North and South America, held every four years known as the Peace and Dignity Journeys. 
Pacquiao co-organizes with Andre and Trula Pepper a safe route across North America, starting in Alaska. After securing and loading up the vans, Pacquiao leads a caravan north to Shikaloon, Alaska. On the way, he gives lectures and picks up runners. In Sonora, Mexico, two Yorem Nation brothers, Masat, also called El Que Corriendo Mata, or He Who Runs Conquers, and his older brother Greñas, takes leave of their family and the university studies to hitchhike several days north to the U.S. border. They journey to fulfill an obligation to their elders, to surrender to the run and embrace the way of the warrior, those committed to the protection and preservation of the land, animals, and their people's culture. These are only some of the marathoners of peace and dignity journeys 2004. They are ordinary people, proud of their heritage, summoned by a cog greater than themselves. And then there's me. So that there was um, my prologue. It's sort of weaving in of some of the runners that, that, that had profound impact on my life and you know, kind of speaks to some of the diversity and, and, uh, of people who, who committed themselves to the run and um, you know, sort of a glimpse into how diverse a lot of us were, how we all were struggling with our own traumas, um, profound traumas, and how we all came together through this medium of running. And uh, you know, there's this reason why this run happens every four years. Um, I think it's to show that you know it, it, it's it's a work in progress, right? That, that change can't happen overnight. That it takes sweat, you know, and it takes work, and it takes us committing to a ritual that that heals not only ourselves but our communities and our lands, right? And so we got to ask ourselves what it is, what ritual it is we're willing to commit ourselves. Um, that, that, that puts in that work, right, you know, and, and here are, you know, this is a glimpse of some of the people that, that showed up and who were willing to put in the work. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, I was going to join this run. It was supposed to happen again this year from Alaska to Ecuador, um, but a lot of things got postponed, so I, I look forward to circling back and doing that, and when I um, do my book tour again, I'm inviting people to come and run with me, um, do some 5Ks, but as soon as, um, you know, the world um, heals, we can't have that discussion. But uh, I'd like to um, read another small chapter that discusses a little bit about um, my reality, um, struggling with what it meant to be working class and how this book challenges all, um, what that looks like and, and who we are and, and you know, coming at it from my perspective. And, and, you know, that's what I talk about. You know, I, I ground all of my running in, in my history, in the culture of working class, in the migratory culture, right? And it's so much more than just burning calories. It's so much more than just, you know, you know, you know mileage, right? And so I think it, um, the people who were capable of running these great miles were the people who literally were carrying the stories of people, specific people, specific regions. The stories, the stories that people shared with me on the run were the things that gave me the energy and the fire to continue running those 15 mile, 20 mile stretches, right? Because you forget about that pain, right? When you know that there are other people unified you know, and, and behind you um, who, who are asking the world to heal and they're asking you know, the world to, to listen to, to the devastation and disposition that, that is happening in the world. So this is sort of a listening journey about telling the world that we're out there and that we've had enough, right? And putting words to that pain. And so this is what this book is, is, is putting words to that pain and, 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 and using our bodies and running as a medium for healing and transforming, right? So this one is called The Palm Springs of Washington. So I don't know if y'all have been in Yakima, you all have seen that billboard alongside the highway, right? It's sort of um, famous, um, but 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 yeah, that that's a that's a message that that, that, that never left me there in Yakima, Washington. Um, not sure if it's still there. I think it still is. But so yeah, this one's called the Pond Springs of Washington. When the rhythms of working class life cut inside me like broken beer glasses, I run. 
I'll run in order to dislodge my problems from where they have taken up residence. And I come upon the Natchez River with my parents' story in, stories in hand. I run hard until my thighs burn toward that, the tributary of the Yakmo River until I can finally clear my throat of anger, slapping my face and chest to remind myself of this heavy flesh, the burden of being human. I run to find relief and to help activate the power within me, pushing myself hard over the hot pavement as if to extinguish flames from my feet. To find courage along the river that flows beside mobile home parks, graffiti landmarks, beer hot factories, and gravel pits. The river and I run next to the Boise Cascade lumber mill with its stacks of failed logs. We run by a billboard that reads, Welcome to Yakwa, the Palm Springs of Washington, in a name intent on covering up the messier realities of the town. Here, east of the Cascade Mountains in Washington State, where the sun shines roughly 300 days a year, is my desert, my hometown of Yakima. The summer evening air swells to the high 90s. Hay mounds, truck stops, and cattle dot the landscape. A sun-baked barn is painted with the words, God bless America. In this region, rich volcanic soils turned over by the hands of many generations of laborers, beginning with the Yakima First Nations people, then people from Europe, Africa, Japan, the Philippines, and now Mexico, have made this land one of the world's leading producers of apples, hops, cherries, and wine grapes. It is a paradise on the surface, but its history is harsh. It is a region that cycles through its most vulnerable people, immigrants who plant and plow. Someday my parents too will pass into the volcanic soil that enriches the region and that I now caress within the palms of my hand along the river where I pause to catch my breath. When I resume, when I resume running, I kick my feet into the ground and huff between my steps moving into the peripheries of the camps of homeless men and women who live in tents along the river, among the tall brush littered with beer cans and syringes. This is Raymond Carver country, an area whose working class narratives have been articulated to the world in the short stories of the local author. Here, along the rivers, old hills and ghettos, I do most of my thinking about what it means to be a son of immigrants what it means to be working class, and what it means to run and explore the land on my own terms, to find forgiveness on a land that feels sometimes like it has broken me, to carve my way out of Carver country and create a new path for myself. So a lot of the stories that I write here um, were really hard to write, you know? And part of the fear I had in writing this story actually took me a long time not to write the story. It took me a long time to decide how to tell the story because I had this fear that of immortalizing my, my family, my people in something so heavy. And sometimes we're not ready to tell the story, right? And I guess I wasn't for a long time. But, you know, or beyond that, right? It's my duty to put this out there, right? I, I, I needed to tell, it was my obligation if I wanted anything to change. And I wanted to put it out there and find a language that conveyed that pain so that I can retransform it, right? So that I have a say, and so I have an ability to confront it, you know? And I tell people that I took up writing and, and what writing does for me is it gives me that ability to, to become that, you know, that child that I couldn't be when I was, when I was a kid. And so, it is healing to, to put this to words, but I also wanted to confront the pain in the, in the details. And I wanted the details to do a lot of the talking, right? Because unfortunately, a lot of people like myself, the writing that we do often gets dismissed in the, any commentary that we may have about the situations in, of our lives. And, and I didn't want that. I didn't want people to dismiss me for this angry Latino who, of course, had these reasons to say. And I had a lot of shame around that. So I did, you know, I played the game and I let the details do the talking. I, I put in the work to let the details drive the narrative and, 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 and make it my job to observe and to record. Um, 
as a duty to my people and my community and the landscape, you know, to record it before it got erased. And in a way, I sort of asserted my humanity through my words. And I didn't want people, and I didn't want people to shy, you know, to turn away from from the pain, you know. And so, so for me, you know, that's what the details do for me. Um, and and you know, it doesn't it doesn't um, hide away from from a lot of the the he heavy narratives, you know. But I also find beauty in that, right? And so the reason I don't shy away from the pain is there's a lot of beauty in pain too, and in the land. And I found a lot of my healing in the landscapes. And, and I found that healing there. And so um, landscape is a very big thing here. It is almost its own character. And growing up speaking Spanish and getting in trouble for speaking Spanish at times in school, I had this fear of language, right? And so I never thought I'd ever become a writer. Um, and so a lot of the ways that I describe these things, I legitimately don't have the words for. And so I sit with things sometimes a bit longer and I probably should because I'm legitimately wrestling with the words to be able to articulate, maybe for the first time, right, in my own way, what that setting meant to me, what these people meant to me, maybe what this landscape meant to me. And in doing so, I was finding a lot of healing. And it's it's a very healthy exercise. So for me, writing is it is it is my religion. Running is my religion. If I had to pick, right, it is my way of of, of connecting spiritually with with the the person that, that's been inside of me, that, that words help me to dislodge, right? And so I hope that resonates with a lot of people out there. This story is just the start of a conversation um, to, to, to a lot of um, uh, pain, I think, that a lot of us are experiencing out there. And if I can bring a lot of, if I can bring attention to the Northwest and, and across the world, you know, I, I hope to do so. And, and not just through writing, but through running, right? committing our bodies physically, you know, you know, um, conquering and dislodging what we can't articulate in words or whatever, right? And so we just got to find that ritual. We just got to find that meaning. We just got to find that language that, 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 that brings us healing, right? But I think as we see in today, today's world, right, the time for silence is, is over, right? And so we have to do something. We have to put words, um, to our pain, and we had to confront evil, or you know, uh, you know, uh, violence. We had to confront that with words, right? Because words are violent, you know, sometimes. And and if we, this is a quote that um, in Scott Mamaday says, and I'll never forget, you are who you are, um, you are what you imagine, right? And so if you fail to imagine, you fail to exist. And if you know, you you know, if you don't imagine someone will imagine for you and, and displace you and erase you. And so it, it is our jobs to imagine for ourselves and for our people and put our words out there and put our narratives out there and, and complicate the narrative because humanity is very complicated. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, that's just what I have for y'all. Um, I could read another, but I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to open it up um, to, 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 to y'all and see if y'all have any questions. About, about about my writing or my story. So um, just let me know, take a step aside. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we so appreciate your voice and your story um, and sharing your experience with us. Um, means you, so much. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna open it up to questions. So go ahead and type your questions in that Q&A box. You can click the Q&A button on your screen um, and again, while we might not have time for everybody's questions, we'll get through as many as we can. So post your questions. Um, our first question says, I am an immigrant, an adopted child with white parents. I'm amazed at you and finally understand my need to run. What would you tell young people today who are hesitant to run, thinking it is not for them? Mm. That's, a, that's a great question. <clears throat> I think... I mean, times are odd right now, right? But I think I think you have to go with that force. I think I, I wouldn't discourage um, any youth from 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 launching themselves into a journey like this, right? I think I think there's there's a language that is very special to you and very specific. If you ask all the other runners that I that I write about that did this run, they will tell you something slightly different, right? They'll tell you what the run meant to them, and 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 what I write is what the run meant to me, right? 
And so, um, but we all showed up, right? And like I said, through this meeting of, uh, of running, well, we're still trying to find the language of what, of what running is to me and what that means, right? That's why it happens every four years. But I think it's a very powerful thing um, for, for, for anybody, you know, especially the youth, and especially when we're struggling to find that language, right? Because we don't often have that model. We don't often have that, that, that language to, 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 to fall back on, right? And so sometimes we have to invent our own language and we have to transform and reclaim our space, right? Because I think that's for me, what the thing is that I was living in a space that wasn't carved out for me, right? It was this harsh working world uh, and my dad told me, you know, you, you know, whenever you can get out and don't be anything like me. And that was, that was traumatic for me because I loved my dad and I honored his work, but I also loved the land, right? As harsh as it was. And so, so he was telling me, you know, this, he was teaching me that this wasn't a land meant for me, but I, so I had to go out there and find it, you know? And so I, I did, and I, and, and, and I'm trying to circle back to my community and, and give people options. Um, and it's a very scary, it's a very scary journey to, to do that alone, right? And so what I'm trying to do is that, you know, you can go out and you do your run and you can go out and you find your language, but just make sure that, you know, you, you're, you're, you're building community, you know, and you're finding community along the way because it can get pretty lonely, right? And so I think at times I did that, um, a little too, too, too alone. And, um, I think I, the run was healing in so many ways because I finally found a family. Uh, that showed me that there's many of us out there um, struggling and, and, and working towards the same thing. So um, I think, I think, I think, yeah, I encourage you, anybody to do this. Um, but I think you'll find that you'll find your very specific language, very specific to you and your narrative, you know, as long as you recall why you're running um, and, and what is it that it's, that's it's motivating you. I think you're, you'll find a good place in that, you know, I don't know if that answered your question or not. That's great, thank you. Our next question is from Sarah, and she wants to know, when did you start realizing that running gave you freedom? Uh, I, think, I think it had to do a lot with exposing myself and complicating my narrative, right? I think I started realizing, I think it started when I saw the strength in myself, right? Like, I think it was, there's few things that I saw in myself that were, that I was proud of. Like, I guess I was, I was too busy trying to be somebody else. I was too busy trying to impress. I was too busy trying to succeed and, and, and you know, and, and be that model, right? I was too busy trying to model the non-Latino image or whatever, you know, because that's just what you're taught to do. You, you have to find and be better than yourself. And so I, I was never part of that equation. When I physically started taking up running, like maybe that's why I, I took up running in the first place. Is that, that was one of the few places that I saw myself as powerful, right? I was good at it, you know, and I felt like that was the only thing I was good at, and and I didn't know why, and and you know, I, I processed a lot, you know, I broke down a lot through my runs, and um, I found a lot of healing through that, and I think you know, and and it, it literally got me moving towards you know the land towards the horizon and for the longest time I wanted to escape right and that was that was the only thing that was driving me for a long time you know but um running was the one thing the one gesture that really got me to go see the world and I think the more you see the more your mind opens up and so I think um the only things I saw growing up was the fields and the warehouses and, and pain right and so I didn't want just to, to see just that. I wanted to see a lot more of the world so that I would complicate the narrative because that's that's how the world is. We're very complicated people and it's a messy process and it's a beautifully messy thing. So running physically got me out there and, and that was my freedom is that I started, to, my eyes started to open up more and I started seeing more with my body, with the bottoms of my feet. I got to see more nature. I got to see more of my people. I got to see more of the struggle and I started building story around mine and and complicating it and, and there's so much power into that you know and so um you know um that i think that, that's where it came for for me thank you yeah um our next question is from steve 
He says, what kind of daily rhythm did you get into um, in order to blend your soul searching with your running and your writing? Mm. I think they're interchangeable, right? I think a lot of my writing is, is rooted in the soil, it's rooted in the landscape. And um, I do most of my thinking out there, you know, when I'm, when I'm running and when I'm moving. And I think it has a lot to do with a lot of my, my writing ethics too. I think um, a lot of my writing before, you know, COVID is I was out there. I, didn't, I don't think I wrote in one place longer than a week. Um, I would write in coffee shops, I would write in libraries, I would write outdoors. I'd, I always carry a journal, a little small journal, you know, like a little thing like this, <laughs> a little notebook in my back pocket. And I'm always taking notes. Um, I'm always just, you know, cycling through words and, and, and reflecting and philosophizing through my running. And oftentimes um, running dislodges me from a lot of things and, and centers me, right? And so um, it's my religion that go hand in hand. Um, and I think, I think, you know, when I get restless, right? I, I, when you read this book, you realize that I'm a pretty restless guy, um, but, I, but I own up to that, you know, and I embrace that. And I think um, there's a reason why, you know, your body, your body talks to you. <clears throat> and if you're getting restless, I think it's because for me, it's just telling me to get out there and, 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 and change your vantage point, change your perspective, you know, take in those breathing rhythms, you know, do those meditative breaths that you're forced to do when you run, right? You're, literally trying to catch your breath and so it centers you it clears your mind and puts things into perspective you know nature does that for me and so um i literally stop on my run mid sweat and and i'll take my notes and i'll write and i'll, and I'll hash that out so i think you have to really put that into practice you know it takes work but i i think for me it's 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 part of my life it's part of how i process so i see writing as kind of like a journaling thing right like I, I take it a scene at a time. I take it a thought at a time and I just put things away and then I come back to it when I'm ready to see the bigger picture. But I try not to overwhelm myself with such big picture thoughts sometimes with my writing. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be kinder to myself around my running and my writing. And I, um, for a long time, and still is, right? Running is still very much a private thing, right? It's, it's my religion, it's my ceremony. Um, it's where I have my most private moments and, and my most healing moments. Um, so, so it's just, it's just an extension of who I am, you know, and it's going to continue and it continues still. So. Thank you. Um, Alicia says the landscape of Boston is very harsh in such a different way than Yakima. What is the landscape of Boston teaching you? Oh, wow. It's teaching me that I miss the Northwest so much. <laughs> I miss it so much. Um, it's so beautiful out there. Um, yeah, yeah. Boston is is, is a big city, um, but you have to make it work, right? No matter where you are, I'm always trying to find those green spaces, right? I, I'm lucky to live near a good piece of green green space, and um, it's different, right? It definitely is, right? But it's it's still nature. It still it still has um, you know, it still communicates its energy, it still has its, its, its grounding, its grounding um, abilities. And so um, you got to get out there, right? You got to get out there. Um, but, you know, part of the thing, you know, in, in having a journey like this is that, you know, you realize some of the things you leave and some of the things you took for granted, you know, and, and every, every step I take, I realize how, you know, how beautiful the Northwest really is, right? And um, and why I was so, I was so, you know, grounded out there. Um, but, but, you know, I left it and, 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 you know, I saw other landscapes, beautiful landscapes, especially on this run. Um, but, but there's beauty everywhere, you know, and, and there's, there's, there's an opportunity to run everywhere and, you know, you can visualize that. And so when I tell people to, when they run, it's not about burning calories. It's not about, you know, that mileage. It's about channeling those stories that you grew up with, channeling that insight that your, your elders, you know, uh, passed down to you, your siblings, uh, those special stories, you know, and, and even those painful ones, right? Like run when you're in pain, run when you're hurting, you know, and, and you'll see that in your, whatever running means to you, right? Like, cause we're not all, you know, capable and able, right? And so whatever, you know, a stroll, or, you know, a, a, 
breath of fresh air or whatever, just remember to, 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 to dedicate that day or dedicate that stroll, or de dedicate that run to a specific story or a specific person and, and channel that while you run. And you realize that there's a lot of healing power in that. And, and, and um, yeah, so um, I think that's the real driving force for me in, in, in running through nature. An opportunity to reconnect with my Northwest an opportunity you know i channel that river that i run alongside all the time through these trees where there is no river and so um you listen to those sounds right and it sounds similar to a river and you hear those birds and you close your eyes and so you can visualize your home and you can visualize your future right what you visualize you like the home you would like to have right and so um i put a lot of energy into the person that i like to be in the world and what that looks like and so it takes practice right because i you know i'm the first to admit that i have a lot of work still for myself and and it's through my runs and through my writing that i try to process some of some of those things and, and try to try to figure out how i can i can better myself and, and my community so thank you thank you Teresa has a question your book and your story inspire me she says even though i'm older what do you wish your elders had told you as you were growing up that might have inspired you? Mm, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is to be kinder to yourself, you know, like teaching me self-love. Um, I think a lot of my driving force had a lot of um, shame and anger in it, you know, and, and that got me places. <laughs> but I, I wonder what love and self-love and um, what other energies and what other values, you know, how much further that would have gotten me, right? And so that's, that's the work that I'm putting in now. And that's the sort of um, work that I'm trying to, to learn, you know, and so um, it took me a long time to get there um, through this run. Um, and, and, and I found, the, you know, my community but um, but yeah, like I, you know, I, I grew up with my parents and and the elders around my parents, um, not specifically my my elder grandparents who were in Mexico, right? And so I didn't really get to know them, you know. And oftentimes, as, as, as a boy, you know, I, you have to grow up fast, right? And there was always this kid inside of me that you know just remained inside. And so I feel like I'm becoming more of a kid the older I get, and I'm trying to you know, really embraced it. You know, I do a lot of work with youth. And so it's probably one of some of my best work because <laughs> I can be a kid, right? And, and you know, it's, it's a fun um, opportunity to, to, to sort of mentor and, and bring some change. So, so, but yeah, I think I would say that. And I would, I would continue to say that to other folks, you know, be kind to yourself, you know, um, you know, and, 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 and do a little bit of self-love and you'll go, you'll go, you'll go very far. Mm. That's good. Um, the next question is, how did you come to know about the Peace and Dignity Run and decide to do it? Mm. Um, a friend of a friend of a friend. <laughs> and I write about that in the book, right? It just, by chance, really. And it, it, it came at a moment when I was having my meltdown, when I, all, like my life had come to a completion, I got accepted into a great college and got a full ride, and only to realize that maybe I wasn't, you know, prepared and fit to to be the one to save my family, to be capable of of completing college. Right, I was struggling um, in college, and and I couldn't turn to anyone. And even if I could, I didn't know how. That wasn't just something I was used to. For so long, the narrative was get to college and do everything you can. It was never, I guess I never believed that I would get to college. <laughs> and then when I got there, I, I didn't know what to do. Um, so, so I feel like this committing to this run was a lifelong thing. Like I think deep down I was gonna do it, you know? And I think um, when I found it, it was because I was, so overwhelmed with, with school and class, I actually skipped class. I said, I, I'm just overwhelmed, I'm not going to do this. And then I went to this this conference and then I just sort of led to this meeting. And then that's where I found out about this run and decided after the presentation by this indigenous uh, uh, leader, 
spoke so beautifully and so emotionally in a way that I never seen in my life, you know, when I up to that point, you know, a male model such emotion, right? Like I was like, this is the person that I want to be, <laughs> someone who can talk freely about his emotions and who can give guidance about how to articulate that and have, you know, no shame around that and articulating such an alternate reality, living in the, in the forest, in the landscapes with indigenous people, talking and sharing with stories and then running it so much of it was just so profound and it just kept hitting me right in the heart and i couldn't understand it intellectually why this was for me but it hit me like like a ton of bricks like i, I felt like this was everything i was waiting for all my life you know and this was my college education you know not in the books and so i decided then and there that i was done that i was gonna jump on this this run do what I can. I dropped out of college to do it. And I didn't, you know, and I told myself I wasn't going to look back. But I won't wait to it. And so I talk about that in this book. And, and you know, I have no regrets, you know, but um, um, you feel it, right? And so I think, I think we have those moments in our lives that I think we can't let go. Can't let go of, right? And so um, it's very, you know, very well could have let go of that moment. But I, I you know scared shitless <laughs> and I, I don't know what I was I just had to do it um so so yeah and it continues to inform and change my life you know because I'm still in touch with these runners and it still continues to run and it happened every four years and it gets bigger and bigger every time and we're showing our numbers that we're we're out there and what we look like is is very diverse and and and, and there's a there's, there's 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 a lot of us out there so that's incredible. Next question is, along with your own stories, the other runners you have met and the stories they told, are there any other books or authors that have influenced your writing? Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, well, part of the work that I did here was, you know, wrestling with how to properly honor the stories of the runners that I was writing about, right? And that's that's a big thing, you know. And so I'm still in touch with them and got their permission and, and try to honor and, and go through those motions um, that made it right for me, you know, telling the story through my perspective. I couldn't have told this story without the runners. I couldn't have told this story without my parents. And so for me, the way I structured this story, is, as you'll see for those who haven't read it, models, it weaves in those, those stories. And it's sort of, I wanted... The book to sort of be a platform to, to, to other communities. I wanted to be a conversation starter for these communities so that those voices could get amplified because oftentimes we get dispossessed you know by by other realities and other spaces and we oftentimes have to create our own our own realities you know um, and so so that's 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 it. and even then you know there's limitations to that right and even me as you know the narrator of my parents story will never understand and i own up to that i will never understand fully my parents story the runner story right and i acknowledge the limitations that that go into to writing something like and so part of the work is not just in reading um as many you know authors and diverse authors that represent a people who are doing the work right you know this is physically getting out there and committing to a community and 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 re-educating ourselves right about what it is to do that and so i'm the first to say people you know um you know i've been doing a lot of you know and scott mama day is a big one for me you know i've been doing a lot of reading with south african literature <clears throat> the uh the drum writers right these are uh, um writers who were part of the apartheid who were investigative journalists right who, who live by the model live, fi live fast die young who, who committed their, their bodies literally to, to getting a story and, and making change, right? And they were, um, so I, I read a lot of these kinds of stories, right? Um, um, a lot of realist writers that, that use the details of observations to, to, to sort of paint these, these really gritty um, stories, um, Cuban Caribbean literature, right? So I'm the first to admit that I have a lot of catching up to do. Um, I uh, writing, reading is 
fairly new thing for me because I didn't know I was uh, gonna be in this. Uh, like I said, I got punished for speaking Spanish <clears throat> when I was younger. So uh, language is a very terrifying thing for me. And so I have um, some sort of disability around my, 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 my ability to read <laughs> um, as fast or, 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 or process, right? Some of these things. So I, I read things and I reread things and I reread things. And, um, and that's just my my process, right? And so, and like I said, a lot of my books are are in people, in in getting out there and and, and having those adventures, sitting with the elders, sitting with people, and having the oral um, exchange of storytelling and and participating in some way, um, and committing to, to 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 feeling out the story physically, right? And if you're unwilling to do that, then maybe you know we're not the right people to tell those stories, right? And so. So it's just I have a different sort of ethics around what it means to tell a story, you know, and and how to honor a story, um, and 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 putting that to words, right, and and throwing yourself into the mix and and honoring the messy nature of all that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next question I'm guessing is from someone who's in high school. It says, "Did you write much in high school?" Mm. Thanks for that question. Um, I only wrote what I was supposed to write <laughs> for assignments, right? Um, but no, I didn't. Um, I yeah, it's it's just interesting how life changes, right? Um, I, uh, I I I I kept a lot of stuff inside, right? Um, it was all in here, and so maybe that's how I became a writer. You know, I just sort of exploded, right? <clears throat> Had a lot of things to say. And and I think we all have our own ways of expressing ourselves. We have, we all have our contribution, right? And 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 it turned out that <clears throat> the paper was my way of doing it. It was an affordable way of doing it. I actually did a lot of drawing as I was a kid. You know, I was visual. I'm a visual learner. Um maybe I think that's what it was when I didn't speak much or I had a fear language or I was just didn't have the right relationships in school I, I drew right I think that was my way of just laying it out as best as I could so maybe my writing is just a, a step from that right I'm trying to paint pictures with words and it's okay not to be good at the language and I guess I want to tell people that it's like I still struggle with grammar <laughs> you don't mean like I was told that without that you know you'd be bad you wouldn't be able to succeed you wouldn't be able to tell your stories but language is so fluid language is changing all the time and like now we're including you know, like telephone, electronic language into our, our literature, right? So it's always changing, so don't give up if you are not fitting in in your language. Like, I think if you're pulled towards language or telling or writing, there's a reason why, right? And so just keep at it and until you find your rhythm. You might, you might be <clears throat> modeling something new for people. You might be finding some new way of expressing something that someone is been trying to express for a really long time and people tell me you know why how do you express scenes so so well and why do you do the things you do and I tell them why well, I legitimately don't know names for things and I'm legitimately wrestling with how to how to describe things and I'm wrestling with the emotion of things and I think that's the work that I do is I'm trying to put language to emotion you know uh, in, in ways that wasn't taught to me so so no, I, I didn't write a lot in high school and the assignments that I had to do and I didn't think I did I didn't get good grades. <laughs> um, so no one told me I was a good writer. And so I, uh, maybe teachers need to do the work as well and, and, and being better about telling us that we're better or we have potential or whatever, you know, in, in certain ways. So, so don't give up, you know, um, keep working at it. Thank you. Um, we've had several questions, so I think that are the same. So I think this will be our last question for the evening. Um, what are you working on next? Mm. Um, similar, similar things. I think I, I really, I'm really jiving with the nonfiction aspect in that it allows me to continue the adventure in the lives of other people. Right. I think I want to continue to amplify the voices of people who are, you know putting in the work working class who are out there in these spaces that that um you know living doing work in the margins people or you know putting in the hard work so for me um i'm always writing regardless of whether i'll be published or not like i have to write because it is an extension of 
who I am and how I need to process. So I encourage that to people who need to process and who need an outlet, you know, be it through art, be it through running, be it through writing. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm writing on something. I've um, been writing some things. I, I always got to put in the work. I, I feel like the way my dad and my mom work, um, I, I, I apply to, to my writing. Um, <clears throat> it's a muscle, right? So you have to put in that discipline. Um, try to write a little bit every day or whatever. Um, whatever works for you, but make make a routine out of it. Um, and don't throw anything out, you know, save it because there's a reason why you're you're putting that to paper. You know, oftentimes it's clearing your throat, but but that might be something you use later. And so so I'm always clearing my throat. I have journals everywhere, piles of them. Um, and I like it. So you gotta love the process. And so <clears throat> one thing I, I remember someone told me is that there's no such thing as a pain-free world. You just gotta ask yourself, what pain are you willing to sustain, right? And so there's pain with everything. You ask yourself, I wanna be a CEO. Okay, what pain is associated with being a CEO? Long hours, driving, being away from family. Okay, is that a pain you're willing to sustain? Cool, then that job is meant for you, right? And you do that, and so with writing, you know, so it's like, okay, what pain is associated with writing? You know, tearing your hair out over a story and writing 30 pages only to get a good paragraph out of that. So you, you know, it's like, that's a pain yet though that I'm willing to undergo, right? And I find it, it's painful, but I, I, I'm willing to, to go through it and I enjoy it, to be honest. So, so, um, so anyways, yeah, more to come. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, um, Noe, for joining us tonight. We have so appreciated um, your powerful story. Remember, everyone, the Spirit Run is available um, on both our Overdrive and Hoopla services. You can check it out at ncrl.org um, and learn more there. This evening's program is part of our NCRL Virtual Reads author series. Um, join us on Tuesday, June 16th to hear from M.T. Anderson. And then again on Tuesday, June 23rd at 4 p.m. to hear from Kristen Hanna. Um, and we hope you can join us in July as well, where we'll be featuring Peter Heller and Blake Crouch. Um, check out our website, ncrl.org, for more information and follow us on Facebook for the latest updates. We hope you all have a wonderful evening. Um, thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone. Mm -hmm.